This event is organized by the organizations Open Secrets from South Africa, the European Center for Constitutional and European Rights, ECCHR, the Yemen-based human rights group Madwana for Human Rights, and Urgewald. Tomorrow is the shareholders meeting of the German arms manufacturer Rheinmetall. And today we would like to talk about the ongoing complicity of German companies such as Rheinmetall and its subsidiaries based in South Africa and Italy in the war in Yemen. A new open secrets report reveals that arms companies in South Africa have profited from sale of weapons to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, two central parties in the Yemeni conflict. ECCHR is working to ensure that a similar case in Italy is dealt with legally and that those responsible are held accountable by means of the rule of law. Urgewalt, in turn, confronts Rheinmetall's board members at the shareholders meeting and calls on Rheinmetall investors to take action. On our virtual panel, I would like to welcome Laura Duarte Reyes, legal researcher at ECCHR, Michael Marchant, researcher at Open Secrets, and Barbara Happe, campaigner on banks and arms industry at Urgewald. Before I ask some questions to our panelists, we would like to show you a video statement by Yemeni human rights activist Osama Al-Faki from the Yemen, Yemeni uh, human rights organization, Matana for Human Rights. The situation continues, the situation in Yemen continues to be the very reason why arms exports to Saudi Arabia, for example, have come into such focus. In March 2015, since then, civilians in Yemen have been suffering from violations committed by all warring parties in different ways. If we take 2020 as an example, Motana for Human Rights documented about 1,020 uh, incidents of harm to civilians and civilian objects, in which more than 900 civilians were killed and injured. These incidents uh, documented across the country were committed by the Ansarullah Houthi Group, the Saudi OELIT Coalition, the forces of the internationally recognized government, the UAE-backed forces, uh, Southern, uh, uh, forces of the Southern Transitional Council, and the UAE-backed forces uh, on the Western Coast. Among the 1,020 uh, incidents documented in 2020, Muatana documented at least 26 Saudi OELIT coalition airstrikes, which killed at least 99 civilians, including 41 children and 15 women, uh, and wounded at least 81 civilians, including 42 children and 19 women. One example of hundreds of airstrikes documented by Muatana is an airstrike took place in, uh, in October 2016 in the village of Lira Hijari in northwest Yemen. The airstrike killed a family of six, including the pregnant mother and four children. At the site of the airstrike, Muatana found uh, bomb remin remnants, and according to the analysis, a suspension log uh, was manuf ma manufactured by RWM Italia SPA, a subsidiary of the German arms manufacturer Remental AG. Based on Muatana's documentation, on April 17, 2018, uh, Muatana European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, um, the Italian Peace and Disarmament uh, Network filed a criminal complaint to the uh, public prosecutor in Rome uh, against managers of RWM Italia, SPA, and uh, senior uh, officials of Italy's National Authority for the Exports of Arms. It's true that countries like Germany suspended arms sales to Saudi Arabia, 
but arms companies continued their business through countries that allow them to sell arms uh, in disregard of the uh, with with disregard of the legal and ethical responsibility. Uh, on the March third, twenty twenty one, Open Secrets published the report "Profiting from Misery: uh, South Africa's Complicity uh, in uh, War Crimes in Yemen." And the report shows that uh, Remental uh, Denel Munitions R RDM and other South African companies have regularly supplied Saudi oil coalition with weapons before and since the war started in Yemen. Finally, I want to conclude with a direct message to Remental's shareholders and investors. Know very well that your business is contributing to the worst humanitarian crisis as declared uh, by the United Nations. Arms sales to abusers like uh, the case of the Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates must end now. Uh, and it's really uh, disappointing that the image of South Africa uh, gets attached to fueling miseries in other nations like Yemen through, through the arms sales. Nations of Global South uh, should be working in solidarity with one another, pushing for accountability and justice, not profiting from each other's destruction. Thank you so much. So as you can see, the civil society in Yemen are very much aware, but also um, very disappointed about how arms manufacturers across the globe and uh, throughout the entire supply chains are fueling the conflict under which they have to suffer so much. So as Osama mentioned, um, I would like to ask Michael Martin from Open Secrets some questions on the report that Osama already mentioned, Profiting from Misery. So Michael, what are the main findings of your report uh, with regard to weapons exported from South Africa being used in the war in Yemen? Thanks so much, Tilman. Um, and good afternoon to everyone who's joined us uh, from Germany, South Africa and elsewhere. It's fantastic to have you uh, participating today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I think that there were two main findings uh, in the Open Secrets Report, Profiting from Misery, that I wanted to uh, introduce now because I think they help frame the discussion, particularly from the perspective of South Africa's complicity in this conflict. And the first major finding is that since the war in Yemen broke out, the proportion of South African weapons, including from companies like Rheinmetall, Danel, uh, and Hensoldt in South Africa, the proportion of those weapons going to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have gone up extraordinarily. So if you look at the years in the run-up to the conflict, often the proportion of South African weapons that went to those two states was in single digits. In 2013, I think it was 3% of South Africa's exported weapons would go to those countries. After the war in Yemen breaks out, suddenly those proportions are closer to 50%. In 2016, 49% of all of South African exported weapons go to Saudi Arabia and they go to the UAE. And it matches up very neatly with their increased role uh, and intervention in the war in Yemen. Um, and so South African weapons have increasingly gone there. The second major finding of the report is that South Africa's regulators who are tasked specifically with regulating the export of weapons have not been fulfilling their legal function and legal duties. So South African law is very clear on the process that has to uh, that uh, arms companies must go through when they want to export weapons from South Africa. And one of the central requirements is that the National Conventional Arms Control Committee, uh, the NCACC, which is South Africa's regulator, it has to take into account whether the export of those weapons risks contributing to worsen conflict or to violations of human rights and international law. And what the report shows is that the regulator has consistently failed to take those uh, issues into account. When we wrote to the regulator asking them why they had continued to approve export permits, despite the evidence in the public domain, in, including by the United Nations, that the two states in question have engaged in possible war crimes and human rights violations against civilians in Yemen. They responded simply to say that that information 
hadn't been brought to them through the correct diplomatic channels, and therefore, essentially, they had not taken it into account. And so what we see is that those South African arms companies, including these two major participants, Rheinmetall Denal and Hensoldt South Africa, are operating in a space where they are able to continue to export en masse to places like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and then not being asked the proper questions by the regulators in South Africa. So specifically, Michael, are those German-owned companies like Rheinmetall and Hensoldt exporting weapons to South African, uh, to Saudi Arabia and the UAE right now? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's a range of weapons that those companies specifically are, are exporting. Um, on the side of Rheinmetall Donnell, one of the most concerning elements of their exports into those countries is that RDM specializes in the export of entire weapons factories, or also known as kind of turnkey solutions, essentially going to a state like Saudi Arabia and saying, we will help you establish a fully functioning ammunitions plant or factory, for example, that has to go through South Africa's export program and, and approvals. And in many cases it has. And in 2016, we know that the former president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, was in Saudi Arabia in al Khaj, about 80 kilometers from Riyadh, for the opening of a Rheinmetall Denel munitions ammunition factory that creates the type of mortar ammunition, 120 millimeter mortars, that have been found in various places uh, in Yemen. And we also know Rheinmetall Denel in South Africa have been very unambiguous about how important the market is to them financially. And so they have repeatedly said in public that part of their financial success is down to their access to markets in the Middle East. And so they make no bones of the fact that they see massive profit opportunity in markets like Saudi Arabia and the UAE. As we'll get on to later, and I'm sure other panelists will speak to, they've been making these statements at the same time that Germany, the German state, has put a ban on weapons exports to Saudi Arabia precisely for these reasons, these concerns. And so we know, for example, that Rheinmetall Denel munitions are going as well. There's also increasing evidence now that Hensoldt's operations in South Africa are doing the same. And so in uh, January of this year, a drone was shot down in Yemen uh, by Ansar Ali forces. Uh, and in that drone, a sophisticated camera uh, manufactured by Hensoldt in South Africa was found. It's used in the drone equipment to, to target and, and track people. Um, and so we've seen in those cases that, that those weapons from those, those companies are certainly ending up uh, used by UAE and Saudi forces or used by forces that are proxies for those countries. And I think it's another thing, uh, just, I guess, to remind the panelists here is that one of the major concerns that we've had and we've expressed is that when you export weapons to countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, it's not just that those states may use them in a place like Yemen, but that they will pass them on to other forces that are, there, that are proxies for them on the ground that will in turn use them. And so in many occasions, we know that South African weapons have been used in Yemen. We might not know precisely whether it was the UAE's national forces or simply an on the ground proxy force that the UAE have been then supplying on weapons. That in itself is a violation of end user certificates and the legal requirements around countries not passing those weapons on. But again, there's no evidence that South African regulators are properly taking those things into account. Well, in, the in theory, the companies must ensure that they are not complicit in human rights violations. Is there any evidence that those weapons you mentioned exported by Rheinmetall and Hensoldt have been used by forces in Yemen also including to target civilians, for, for example? So we know, uh, and this is predominantly down to the work of organizations like Motana, um, and Osama obviously spoke to that in that video up front, that there have been widespread instances of the targeting of civilians uh, in Yemen. We also know now pretty much every year for the last four years, the UN a group of experts on Yemen have reported to uh, the UN and the Security Council that the conduct of all the forces um, in Yemen, particularly the UAE and Saudi, 
likely amounts to war crimes. Um, and, and that's a very strong statement for that group to make. So we know that those things are happening. In terms of direct evidence, the clearest and most concerning case about the weapons from a German subsidiary in South Africa finding their way into one of those attacks is the attack on the port city of Hodeida in June of 2018. And what happened in that attack was that forces on the ground used 120 millimeter mortars uh, to launch what is commonly referred to as a double tap attack. So they launched an attack on the fishing port uh, with those mortars. And then an hour later, a follow-up attack on the first responders, including at a nearby hospital. Um, and that was an attack on civilians um, that killed and wounded uh, many hundreds. Two independent investigations into that attack have established that it is uh, incredibly likely that those weapons came from Rheinmetall Donnell or Rheinmetall in Germany. And I mentioned earlier the factory set up by RDM in Alkaj. It specializes in the production of precisely the type of ammunition um, found at the site of that attack. And independent analysts from the journalist group Bellingcat and the UN Special Committee on this investigated and found that the mortar remnants found at the site of the attack most closely mirror that. So that, that is the evidence that is currently regarding RDM weapons. Just to finish off that point, what I wanted to say is that we, we tried to get RDM on record on this point. And so we asked them outright whether they've done anything to discover whether the evidence is true and whether their weapons were used in that attack and whether they're concerned about that. They have refused to answer that question. And just to be clear, that is not a denial. It's also not a no comment. It is an absolute refusal to acknowledge that the question has been asked of them. And we followed that up several times um, and they will not go on record in that regard. So it's important to keep on the pressure. And Rheinmetall also always states that, of course, they obey the rule of law and any policies regarding arms export. But what role has Rheinmetall played in influencing arms export policies in South Africa, for example? So this is where the, the two kind of stories here really come together, Tilman. So as you've just said, Rheinmetall and Rheinmetall Donnell in South Africa are very clear that they comply with the legal requirements. And it is important for everyone listening to be very clear here. There is no evidence in South Africa that they have exported weapons without a proper permit. And that's one of the major findings here is that our regulators in South Africa are failing to enforce the legal requirements and companies like RDM are getting permits. We are very clear that we do not think that that removes their responsibility or complicity in these types of crimes. It's not enough to say that well, the regulator gave us a permit when there is extensive public knowledge about the types uh, of atrocities that are being committed. But the second part of this, and this goes to your question, is their role in South Africa. There was a small period in South Africa where the regulator did stop weapons exports going to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, particularly around concerns around end user certificates and the fact that Saudi Arabia and the UAE Uh, were reticent to sign them if they were going to be allowed um, inspections from the South African case. And what's so interesting in this case is that Rheinmetall Donnell were the most active, one of the most active companies in South Africa to lobby the regulators to end that ban. Uh, they were one of the only companies in South Africa willing to be publicly named and to go on record writing extensively to South Africa's government and regulator to say you have to end the ban on weapons exports, because we need to be able to return to it as quickly as possible. And what appears, certainly appears from the record and the timeline of events is that that pressure from RDM and the companies like it had a significant influence because it was almost immediately after that, that the weapons exports uh, resumed, uh, that our regulator in South Africa backed down and that weapons exports to those countries were allowed to resume. Well, thank you, Michael, for these insights um, about the situation in South Africa and the entanglement between the state and the companies and how the companies such as Rheinmetall um, uses every angle to um, use the still existing possibilities to profit from 
the arms trade. There's a similar case in Italy and um, the European Center for Constitutional Human Rights is working closely with civil, so civil society organizations from Italy and Yemen to um, get those um, people who are responsible for a similar arms trade going from Italy towards Saudi Arabia, for example, to um, help them accountable. And this is why I would like to ask Laura Duarte um, on the situation in Italy. What is the role of Rheinmetall and its subsidiary RWM Italia in the supply of weapons in Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the context of the war in Yemen? Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and thank you very much, Tillman, um, and everyone that has joined us today. I'm very happy that we are able to have this important conversation. So uh, to answer to your question, at ECCHR, we have already been working for some years on the role and responsibility of European arms experts in the war in Yemen. And we have found that one metal subsidiary in Italy, a company called RWM Italia, has played a crucial role in fueling this war, mainly through the supply of MK80 series bombs to members of the Saudi-led coalition. And in particular, we have come across evidence showing that between 2015 and 2018, several export licenses have been granted by the Italian authorities to RWM Italia for the export of such bombs to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And as we will discuss later today, the use of this type of bombs for the commission of potential war crimes by the coalition in Yemen has been confirmed by various sources. And despite this, numerous loads of bombs manufactured by RWM Italia have left Italy to Saudi Arabia since the outbreak of the conflict, which clearly shows that Rheinmetall subsidiary in Italy has played a significant role in supporting the military operations of the coalition in Yemen. So also in this case, have you found clear evidence that the bombs and weapons manufactured by RWM Italia have been used in the war in Yemen? Yes, so as I was saying before, the use of MK-80 bomb series in the war in Yemen has been documented in a number of different sources. And one of them is a report by the UN panel of experts uh, uh, on Yemen issued in 2017, in which the panel reported about two different airstrikes on the city of Sana that occurred in 2016, and in which remnants of bombs produced by RWM Italia were found. And then we have another second source which are the field investigations carried out by our partner Muatana for Human Rights regarding an airstrike carried out on October 8th of 2016 on the village of er, uh, Der Al Hayari in Yemen. And this is the airstrike to which Osama was referring before uh, to in his video. So in this airstrike, six civilians, including four children and a pregnant woman were killed. Uh, and as on the side of the strike, remnants of a bomb uh, produced by RWM Italia, specifically a suspension lock, which is a device which is used to attach the bomb to the aircraft, was found. So this attach allegedly carried out by the coalition is at the center of a criminal complaint that ECCHR and our partners filed before the Italian courts back in 2018. And I'll talk about this legal action in more, in more detail later on, uh, but I would like to point out here that in the course of the investigations in Italy, it has been proved that the suspension lock that was found at the site of this airstrike was sent to Saudi Arabia between April 2015 and November 2015. So at a time when atrocities being committed in Yemen were already widely known to both RWM Italia, so the directors of the company, and to public officials that granted the license for the export. Yeah, about those licenses, you mentioned this. these licenses are crucial. What is the current status um, from those export licenses from Italy to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates? Yeah, so thank you for this question, uh, Timan, because it is really interesting and also encouraging to see that the Italian government has taken very positive steps in this regard. So already in July 2019, the Italian government decided to suspend licenses to export missiles, uh, to export missiles and bombs to Saudi Arabia and the UAE for 18 months. And this measure was about to expire uh, by the beginning of 2021. 20 
But in January, the Italian government not only confirmed this measure, but also decided to permanently revoke existing licenses to export missiles and bombs to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And this revocation, which followed a recommendation by the parliament, uh, who showed the dramatic situation of the war in Yemen, um, this revocation applied to at least six export licenses that had already uh, been suspended back in 2019. And interestingly, one of these licenses had been granted to Rheinmetall subsidiary in 2016 for the export of almost 20,000 MK80 series bombs worth over 400 million euros. And a very important development on this front that I would like to highlight here is that the company RWM Italia appealed the decision of the government to suspend and revoke these licenses. But on April 2017, so just two weeks ago, an administrative court in Rome rejected the appeal, arguing that the risk that the weapons subject to those authorizations may be used to target civilians in Yemen are amply sustained and serious. And the judge also said that the protection and safety of the civilians population prevails over the company's desire to preserve its market share. So these are very important decisions that for us confirm that there is an urgent need to investigate the responsibility of Italian arms exporters in the war in Yemen. And we also hope that other governments, like for instance, the South African one, could replicate these measures, not only to fulfill their international human rights obligations, but also to stop contributing to the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. And we have seen uh, from Michael's presentation that this is also happening there. So we hope this is an example that can be also followed. So in the case of Italy, we can see that the protest and um, the raising of voices within the civil society can turn into concrete political consequences. Mm, but it's also always important to mention those companies responsible. Um, Barbara Happe from Urgewald has had a lot of experience in the last couple of years confronting companies such as Rheinmetall at their shareholder meetings. So Barbara, how has Rheinmetall specifically justified the ongoing business with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates at, at their AGMs in, in recent years? Okay, shall I switch to German or shall I talk in English? Um, It's equal? I think so, if, what, if yeah. you like to, to continue in English. Okay. Um, okay, um, we, um, for years we have regularly visited all the annual shareholder meetings of Rheinmetall and uh, commented critically on its business strategies and we asked critical questions. Uh, this is possible because uh, shareholders transfer their voting rights to us and which gave us so the right to speak also in front of the larger investors, etc. And in recent years, the war in Yemen was also very important topic at the AGMs. And three years ago, for example, a representative of Montana was with us at the annual shareholder meeting. Two years ago, a representative of a South African NGO attended the meeting and both asked very critical questions and confronted the group with the facts, which was also already presented by Michael and Laura. So, and the reaction of the, um, of the board was very frustrating. Um, they always uh, stated, oh, we have, uh, we have the export licenses and as long as we have them, um, that, so we are acting legally and we do not bear any responsibility. So they always are doing that they are not responsible for the con consequences of the use of the weapons they um, supplied. And what was really frustrating also for the representative of Montana, for example, was that there was not even a word of regret or something like this about the consequences of the war in Yemen uh, with its countless victims uh, crossed the, the, board, the lips of the board. Um, externally, the company is currently trying to polish a little bit its image. So uh, recently, um, Rheinmetall joined the UN Global Compact, uh, which uh, commits to, to the protection 
uh, of human rights and in future also the management said that uh, they will that 20 percent of their revenues will depend on achievements of certain sustainability criteria so but this in in reality this is pure uh, green and social washing, I think, because at the same time as already described for Italy and South Africa, the company is fighting everywhere for an end of export restriction to the MENA region, also in Germany, and is always looking for new ways and to do business with despots and autocrats. So you and your company ask investors to divest from Rheinmetall as a consequence of their ongoing business and um, complicity in human rights violations. What, what role um, do divestment campaigns play to change business strategies um, yeah. of those companies such as Rheinmetall? Yeah, I think convincing arms producer to stop building uh, arms um, is an undertaking that uh, will not succeed so uh, easily. So you need other campaigns and other uh, strategies to, to succeed. And on the one hand, it is obviously you need uh, campaigns regarding uh, the politicians and the governments um, struggling to put a stop to such abuse and to prohibit arms exports to worrying countries and uh, these kind of things. But in addition to this, I think that legal campaigns and also divestment uh, campaigns can play a central role in forcing companies to stop um, doing such, uh, such dirty business. Rheinmetall, for example, um, mentioned itself in its latest annual report uh, that sustainable and uh, human rights criteria, um, that if they do not take them sufficiently into account, then, uh, and I cite now, then we are afraid that investors will remove the company from their portfolio and financial institutions will either no longer grant loans or only to do so at increased cost. So this means that they also already mentioned it at the annual report that they already are aware that there's a certain uh, pressure on them to, uh, to at least behave uh, or show uh, a little bit more sustainable or that they have, uh, that, that they put uh, human rights uh, things in account, even though in fact they do not. Other investors and shareholders often insist that direct engagement with the company is more effective um, in comparison to divestment campaigns. But um, in your case, how, how successful has your campaign on, on Rheinmetall divestments been so far? Who has already sold their Rheinmetall shares? Yes, um, for example, in October last year, I don't know if you have already, if, if, if some of you have, men uh, have mentioned it, this, uh, one major Rheinmetall investor, the British investment company, um, Janus Henderson, has sold um, its Rheinmetall shares. Um, and the deal involved around 3% uh, of the sh whole share capital. And this was quite impressive uh, because uh, uh, from one day to another, the, the share price uh, dropped by around 10%. Um, and but and uh, Ryan, when Rheinmetall was confronted with this, um, the Rheinmetall uh, CEO stated, um, uh, but even though we are not ready to change our business um, or deficit business in light of this current ESG wave. So uh, stating that they, even if there are some investors who are not interested <laughs> any longer in investing in them, they are still uh, stay uh, to their business. And on the other side, uh, what is also happening now that we have another company within the top 10 or no, not a company and another investor that is the Norwegian pension fund who is reconsidering its uh, investment criteria. And within the next week, they will decide on probably also a divest from Rheinmetall Rhein because uh, at the moment, Norway will decide on a bill um, that, uh, that will exclude companies that sell weapons to states in armed conflict um, when the use of these weapons um, constitutes a violation of international human rights law. 
So I think um, uh, this is, uh, we hope really that uh, the uh, Norwegian uh, pension fund will divest from Rheinmetall. Rhein and if they will, that, that this bill will pass the parliament within the next few weeks, because it is not only Rheinmetall, but several other companies in which the Norwegian pension fund is uh, invested, which are involved in the war in Yemen, like Leonardo, Dassault, Raytheon, Thales, or General Dynamics. And on the other hand, it's also important if you have one of the most important institutional investors uh, to divest, then this always have impact also of other uh, investors. So, and uh, the Norwegian pension fund is uh, always seen also as a pioneer in, um, uh, in have ethical criteria, which is also we copied by a lot, uh, which is often we copied also by other investors. So, yeah, thank you, Barbara, for these insights on the divestment campaign on Rheinmetall. Before we go to the question from our audience, I remind you, you are welcome to use the question and answer function, the Q&A function of Zoom to do this and to answer our panel, to question our panelists. Um, I would like to um ask laura again so we heard from barbara that divestment campaign is one strategy the other is the legal strategy of ECCHR. um so what what specific legal actions have you undertaken to address the role of the european arms trade in the war in yemen um particularly in the case of the italian subsidiary yes so we, uh, as I said before, we have been working, working very closely with our partner Muatana, and we have addressed the role of European arms trade in the war in Yemen, including the role of Rheinmetall subsidiary in Italy at both the international and the national level. And at the international level, we have turned to the International Criminal Court, while at the national level, we have addressed national criminal courts in Italy. So I'll just briefly mention the main aspects of both legal interventions. Um, in December 2019, ECCHR, uh, together, as I said, with Moatana and with several European partners, presented a communication to the International Criminal Court asking the Office of the Prosecutor to investigate the potential criminal responsibility of the managers of arms companies from UK, Germany, Italy, Spain, France, and Germany. And these companies are the ones that also Barbara just mentioned before, like Leonardo, Buy Systems, Dassault, Raytheon, and Airbus, amongst others. And we also asked the Office of the Prosecutor to investigate into the potential responsibility of high-ranking government officials for contributing to the commission of war crimes in Yemen. So in this communication, we present evidence of 26 airstrikes allegedly carried out by the coalition on civilian and civilian infrastructure, which illustrates the pattern of warfare by the coalition, which is characterized by intentional indiscriminate attacks on civilians and civilians objects. And one of the incidents presented in this communication corresponds to the airstrike on the village of Der Al Hayari that we have been referring to, and in which a, rem a remnant of a bomb produced by RWM Italia was found. So the evidence presented in this communication shows that European arms, including the bombs produced by Rheinmetall subsidiary in Italy, significantly contributed to the capacity of the coalition for the commission of those crimes. And we are currently waiting for the Office of the Prosecutor to issue a decision on, a decision on whether or not they will start a preliminary investigation, and this decision should be issued by the end of 2021. And now uh, moving to the national level, um, so we together again with Mat Moatana for Human Rights and our Italian partners, the Rete Italiana for Pace e Disarmo, in 2018, uh, we filed a criminal complaint concerning the airstrike uh, on the village of Der Al Hayari, um, in which, as we said, a remnant of a bond produced by RWM Italia was found. And in this complaint, we asked the prosecutor to investigate the responsibility of Italian public officials of WAMA, which is the National Licensing Authority in Italy, for the offense of abuse of power. And we also asked to um, investigate the potential responsibility of the directors of RWM Italia, 
<clears throat> for the crimes of murder and personal injuries, because as we uh, have been discussing before in this incident, six uh, people were killed. So we argue that due to the abundance of information in the public domain regarding the serious violations of international humanitarian law by the Saudi-led coalition, Italian arms experts were authorized by the WAMA officials and exported by RWM Italia, while knowing that these arms might be used for the commission of uh, war crimes in Yemen. And as Michael said before, it is also clear in the Italian case that public officials didn't abide by the national and international normative frameworks regulating arms experts in Italy, which clearly state that in, the ca in case there is a risk, a serious risk that the weapons might be used for the violation of international humanitarian law, licenses should not be granted. So following the filing of this complaint in 2018, the investigations started and one year and a half later, so in 2019, the prosecutor asked uh, for the dismissal of the case. And we of course appealed this, this request for dismissal. And in February of this year, a judge of preliminary investigations in Rome sided with the victims in Yemen and ordered the prosecutor to continue the investigations and to acquire further information um, relevant to the case within the next six months uh, following the ruling. So uh, just to wrap up here, something key in this decision that I want to share with you today is that the judge recognized that the conflict situation in Yemen and the potential risk that exported armaments could have been used for the commission of war crimes was already known by 2015. And this means that the bomb used in the Der al hayari attack was exported when the serious violations of international humanitarian law by the coalition in Yemen were already known to both public officials and the directors of the company. And finally, I'd like to highlight that the ruling further stipulates that economic interests cannot prevail over the defense of human rights, which must be respected by the state and also by private companies. So we see that also at the judiciary level, things are moving further and the serious risks attached to arms experts to Saudi Arabia and the UAE are being confirmed and recognized by national court and are also under the radar of the International Criminal Court at the moment. Well, speaking of economic interests and investors, well, what do you think, Laura, what impacts should those legal actions you've been doing uh, have on the role on investors and their responsibilities? Yeah, so as I, as I was saying before, I think that with all these legal actions and political developments, it is becoming increasingly clear that when defense companies continue to supply weapons to countries implied in the commission of uh, war crimes or violations of international human rights law, uh, humanitarian law as well, despite publicly available information on the abuses being committed, companies are opening themselves up to both reputational risk and also to potential criminal liability. And this is something that investors and shareholders should also care about. And this responsibility ultimately falls also on, on their shoulders. So, and then we see here mainly three actions and maybe Barbara can also complement uh, this intervention here that shareholders could um, undertake in this regard. And the first one is to use uh, the information we are sharing here today to ask critical questions to the managers uh, of the corporation. And second, that they should bear in mind that there is the possibility to not approve the performance of the board and the CEO, so not to not discharge them from the liability from liability for the administrative work they have done on behalf of the company. And this might be a strong message on the position of shareholders towards the company's decision. And third, um, I also think that they should consider that they might have a responsibility if the behavior of the company doesn't change. So if this company continues to export uh, arms to countries with a very bad human rights records and investors continue to support financially this activity, then ultimately there might also be responsibilities um, for investors in this regard. Yes, thank you for highlighting also the issue of due diligence of investors. So we have seen some developments in the case of RWM Italia. Coming back to the case in South Africa, Michael, um, what will Open Secrets and you 
uh, do now in, in, in the case of um, RDM in South Africa? So as, uh, as indicated earlier, Tilman, we, we released the report around, around two months ago. And I think one of the things just to flag up front, uh, again, this is, I think, an encouraging point, is that there is far greater discussion uh, in South Africa about this uh, now that the report is out than there was a little while ago. One of the things that we flag in the report is that it is, it is too easy for countries like South Africa, Germany, elsewhere, to view Yemen as a problem that happens very far away and that has nothing to do with them. And I think what we've tried to do here and the work of all of these organizations is to bring it home to people um, that it is a, a system that we are deeply complicit in that is contributing to that. And so in terms of next steps, the one thing I do want to say is that it is encouraging that the leadership of Danel, which is the co-owner of RDM with Ryan Mattel, have for the first time been explicitly summoned to parliament to ask questions about why they are exporting to these countries and whether their exports are going to Yemen. At the same time, several ministers responsible for this, including the Minister of Public Enterprises, and we would hope ultimately the Minister of Defence as well, are also being summoned to Parliament to answer those questions. And that's the first time that that has happened. And we are at least hopeful or encouraged that the institutions that are supposed to provide accountability in these cases are doing so. At the same time, Open Secrets is very clear that we are engaging with civil society partners and others in South Africa to monitor the situation. Just last week, we have now received confirmation that in 2020, more South African weapons have gone to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, despite our, in our continuous uh, correspondence with the regulators around these concerns, bringing this to their attention. And so we are considering all options at the moment. And if we don't see any uh, action from the regulator and from others within government and the companies to stop the trade, we will have to act uh, in various ways. And that may well include legal action. We are, we are considering all of those, those possibilities at this stage. Um, there is a question for you from the audience, um, Michael, specifically on Danelle. And um, I remind you, if you want to ask a question to our panelists, please use the Q&A function of Zoom. Um, Michael, concerning Danelle, do the mortars used have identity, identity serial numbers on in order to determine whether the ones from Danelle are used there for human rights violations? This is a question from Zona Morton. Mm -hmm. So un unfortunately, in the in the case of uh, the the mortars found at the site of the Hodeida attack, no. Um, some of the identifying features of that mortar, and this is often by design in the weapon systems, are destroyed on impact when that weapon is used. And so what was used to identify those mortars were um, some of the fin assembly thing, uh, fin assemblies that sit on the back of the, the actual mortar bomb um, and a few of those physical characteristics. And it was that uh, that was used. And so unfortunately, uh, what we don't have in the case of the Rheinmetall Danel mortars is we don't have, as Laura said, in the, the Italian version of a specific element that could be linked to a trade within a certain amount of time. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't been the case uh, in the RDM mortar um, case. And another question maybe to all also specifically on the evidence, um, a question from Cliff Rubin. What about documented evidence of exported self-propelled G6 artillery? So firing 1655M RDM shells in Yemen, in both the port of Adan and the besieged city of Taiz. Absolutely. It's a really important point uh, and one that I wanted to pick out because Uh, and just to be clear, Rhein Metall Danel Munitions and, and Hensoldt are not the only South African companies exporting to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. There's extensive evidence of a whole range of South African weapons. The howitzers are one example. There are several armored vehicles that have been found in Yemen. Uh, there are at least two South African drones that have been shot down and identified in Yemen as well. And so that is why the report, Profiting from Misery, 
while it focuses on, on RDM because of the German ban and the importance of that story, there is a chapter in there on all of the weapon systems identified in Yemen. Um, and I would urge anyone who is interested in those stories um, to look at that. One of the challenges we have, and uh, uh, this goes back to Laura's point about the timing, some of those weapons were seen very early on in 2015. It's entirely possible that some of those were exported uh, a, a certain period before the war started. Um, and that's certainly the, the case for many South African weapons. What, and I return to the point I made at the beginning, what's so concerning is that despite the fact that as early as 2015, South African weapons were being found in Yemen, the proportion of South African weapons exports approved going to those countries has gone up exponentially in that time. And there's been no response from the regulator or the companies when they hear the evidence of their weapons being found at the site of civilian attacks. There's no response to address it, investigate, or to stop it. In fact, the response is precisely the opposite. We see an increased willingness to export to those countries and a desire to increase the market share, uh, regardless of the consequences. Um, we have another question from Cliff Rubin on the role of trade unions, maybe in all of our cases in, to Laura, Baba, and Michael. In the case of so South Africa, Italy, and Germany, um, aren't Rheinmetall factories in South Africa and Germany unionized? What does the IG Metall and other trade unions, for example, and their representatives that sit in the board or the supervisory board have to say about the suspect exports regardless of export licensing? So maybe Barbara, you could start about the situation of the trade union here in Germany. Yeah, perhaps. Um, yeah, I think the, train, the trade unions here in Germany don't seem to be very interested in this issue. After all, it's also about their jobs. And uh, if you look in the, also in their argumentation, it is more so it, if, it is, if such exports are legally okay, uh, then they have uh, no problem so far with it. And um, and so far also during annual shareholder meetings, et cetera, no union representative uh, have approached to us on the situation or uh, and have asked further questions on it. Yeah, Laura, do you know um, the situation in Italy and trade unions? Yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't specifically know about trade unions, but I know that there have been um, several protests also from um, workers of this of the factory of RWM Italia in Sardinia that have opposed to the export of these uh, weapons to Saudi Arabia. And this is also a very heated discussion in the Italian context and that has been addressed by the judge in, this, um, in the later judgment when she decided or ordered to continue with the investigations um, in the criminal case because the prosecutor initially um, argued that there was no uh, basis to continue the investigations because there was uh, the company had to continue with this business, otherwise it would have put at risk several job posts uh, and the, the employment uh, situation in Italy would have been affected. And the court uh, in this sense specifically uh, said that the state has the obligations to guarantee both the employment levels, but also the respect for human rights, both in Italy and abroad. So there is also this discussion here on, on the rights of, of employers in this sense, but there has been uh, support for from some of the employees of the company um, against the actions of the directors in this regard. Yes. Um, before going to Michael, um, again, you're invited to ask questions using the Q&A function by Zoom in the menu below. Until now, I do not have any more questions, but um, still, um, what about the situation of trade unions and their representatives in South Africa? Michael. We are not aware, similarly to the points made by Barbara and uh, Laura, we're not aware of any uh, union official coming out strongly in South Africa in relation to this issue. Um, 
I think what is so interesting about the common answers uh, that we're hearing here is this focus on jobs. And I think it's quite helpful for us to acknowledge that this is a massive point that the, the arms industry uses to try and justify their conduct, that every time anyone asks them questions uh, around their complicity in these types of crimes, they come back with the argument that they contribute economically, domestically by creating jobs. And I think that it's important if the unions aren't going to raise this issue, I think for society more broadly to raise the issue that obviously, firstly, as, as Laura has already said, that's not a trade-off that our society should be willing to make, um, that our complicity in some of the very worst war crimes could be worth it for that kind of trade-off. But at the same time, and this is very important, is that these companies often overstate the fact that they would be the only ones capable of creating jobs. It's entirely possible for countries to decide to shift the production facilities used, for example, in the manufacture of weapons that usually receive massive public subsidies and government money already going into that process, and to divert that public investment into productive means uh, and pr productive and employment opportunities that aren't simultaneously involved in complicity uh, in international crimes. And I, I think it's really important that, that collectively we push back against that argument that, that so often comes from, from the industry itself and, and sometimes is, uh, is accepted by, um, by the unions uh, and them not speaking out. Um, and then Tillman, if I, if I may, I did see one other question just come up around intellectual property from, from Ruth. And I wanted to say that I, I am not uh, aware in all instances of how that, that is shared. It, it's very clear that Rheinmetall is a 51% owner of RDM. And so in many cases, that intellectual property will be the same. In the case of the mortars, one of the things that is so difficult is to distinguish a Rheinmetall manufactured or Rheinmetall Denel manufactured mortar because uh, our assumption is they share that intellectual property. But what I did want to flag is that there is also a very concerning trend in South Africa of intellectual property occasionally, apparently unlawfully being sent to Saudi Arabia. Um, that's certainly the case from Denel. And it's another thing um, that all of these countries and uh, need to be aware of from a regulatory standpoint is that it's not only the, the question of sending weapons, but also the technological capabilities and the intellectual property to enable those countries to then produce the weapons themselves. And so it is something definitely that is, that's deserving of attention. Yes, there's also another legal question from Andrew Feinstein maybe for Laura, um, are there any possible legal remedies in Germany for Rheinmetall's offshoring of its export through Italy, South Africa, etc.? cetera? Um, what is the legal situation? Yes, thank you, Tillman. So I have to say that I am not an expert in German law. I am more in charge of the international cases. But I can say that I know that there is narrow space in Germany to do that. And that is also why we have also tried to address the responsibility of subsidiaries um, and not the headquarters. But it is time, I would say, to do something also in Germany. And there have been discussions of the possibility of um, filing a complaint before a national contact point of the OECD. So using the OECD guidelines to seek the accountability of the corporation of the headquarters of Rheinmetall in Germany. And I'm also aware that there has been a law proposal, including license requirements for setting up subsidiaries abroad that was not passed into law, but it should definitely be part of any law reform in Germany um, because it would actually serve to mirror the globalized status of the business also in the law. Um, but um, I invite um, the person who asked this question to maybe also follow up this, um, follow this question to us and maybe my colleagues who are experts on German law can give um, a more specific answer to this. Yes, um, would someone respond directly? If not, um, there is another question um, about what to do and how civil society in general can help. 
And um, there's a specific question about signing petitions, raining awareness and protests. And um, I know that at least in Germany tomorrow, on the occasion of the annual general meeting of Rheinmetall, there will be three protests. And um, Barbara, I would like to ask you, what is Urgewalz and other organizations plan for protests tomorrow? Yeah, um, as you may know, the annual shareholder meeting will take as a virtual annual shareholder meeting, which means that we only can um, can ask questions, um, uh, written questions uh, that will be um, answered then at, uh, from the board, but we cannot make really uh, actions in front of the Uh, and our shareholder meeting. So, but uh, nevertheless, we have decided or several groups have decided to organize smaller actions in front of factories and of the, uh, the main seat of Rheinmetall. So one action will take place at 10 o'clock for uh, in, in front of the headquarters of Rheinmetall in, in Düsseldorf, uh, uh, in the main factory in Unterlöse, there will be an action at 11 o'clock and several actions will also take place in Berlin as a Berlin site of um, Rheinmetall and Urgewald and Greenpeace together, we also organized um, a Twitter storm or calling for Twitter storm and uh, would like uh, to ask you to join us in this Twitter storm under the hashtag healthcare not warfare. And yeah, we would be very happy if you could participate and to make a little bit more pressure on Rheinmetall to really change its business, uh, deadly business. Yes, until my need, sorry, if you might, if I maybe can jump in here sure. um, to just say that we have also um, started a public petition to German, to the government of uh, the five countries that we address in this communication we presented to the ICC to um, issue bonds, export bonds to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And also to, it's a petition that everyone can sign. And I have just sent a link here in the chat uh, that is also calling on the uh, office of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to um, start a preliminary investigation on this issue. So this is also something that civil society can get involved with. And as I said, you have the link in the chat and it would be great if you can join us in this petition too. All right, thank you. So as you can see, we need all sectors and branches of the civil society to put on the pressure on those companies involved and those responsible also on the political side. Um, there is a question specifically on the situation in South Africa. For example, a question from, um, from Zona Morton from the SAHRC. How can this office assist with the legal aspect to hold Danelle accountable? Maybe for Michael? I think Open Secrets uh, and our partners in South Africa would love to, to take that decision uh, or that discussion further, Zona. So if you'd like to reach out to us, um, I think we'd be very excited to do so. Uh, to answer that question and also the one before about what we can do in South Africa, On a very basic level, I think we need to continue asking questions of our public representatives who are supposed to provide oversight uh, of this industry and of this trade. But also I would really encourage uh, those on the call now to, to follow Open Secrets. We are certainly hopeful of being able to announce quite significant next steps um, in terms of this work over the coming months. Um, and there will be then in that case, further instances where people can lend support in various ways with regard to ongoing uh, advocacy work uh, around this issue. All right, thank you. Um, I think there was another question on South Africa. Uh, the situation in Western Cape, um, there is a community exposed to harmful, toxic and hazardous chemical substances for years. Um, Michael, do you know anything about it and uh, how, how we could react? So I see that that question uh, regards predominantly the or appears to regard the Norwegian uh, pension fund and their investments in that. That is not something that I have uh, any direct or great knowledge of, but I'm not sure Barbara or anyone else 
um, working with uh, the Norwegian investors, whether that might be something that could be followed up in that regard. Uh, I, I didn't get it now, Michael. What do you want? Do you want me to to uh, to state? Um, perhaps it, it could be something that we discuss uh, after the fact. But there is a question here from South Africa around the Norwegian government's pension fund ownership uh, of um, a facility in the Western Cape uh, and its release of of harmful toxins into the environment. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. As we come uh, to an end of our discussion, I would like to thank everyone on our panel, but also all of our attendees and your interest and questions. And um, as you can see, our organizations continue to stay on top of the issue uh, on international arms supply chain and its problems. And um, well, as Barbara mentioned, Greenpeace and Urgewald are calling for a protest tomorrow. There will be protest online on social media. The hashtag is healthcare, not warfare. And there will be rallies and protests in three locations in Germany. And also, if you're interested, there is a press release released today by ECCHR and Urgewald, which contains all the information and the links to the reports. And of course, you're also invited to read the uh, Profits from Misery report by Open Secrets if you have not done so. Um, yeah, with this, um, if there are no more questions, I would like to thank our panelists. Thank you for your interventions and insights. And um, yeah, I would like to close the event and yeah, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.